Amen. Today's sermon is all about Peter. Some people just love Peter, and some people just tolerate Peter. Whatever you think about Peter, he is a foundational figure in the church through the ages. All three the main branches of the Christian church. The Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then we have Martin Luther there representing the Protestant Church. All of these, it was massively impacted by Peter. This was unexpected because Jesus prophesied about him. Sorry, excuse me. This was not unexpected because Jesus prophesied about him. He said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The Wikipedia entry says the Pope is the Bishop of Rome, chief pastor of the worldwide Catholic Church, and head of state of, or sovereign of the Vatican City State. The primacy of the Bishop of Rome is largely derived from his role as the apostolic successor to St. Peter, to whom primacy was conferred by Jesus, giving him the keys of heaven and the powers of binding and loosing, naming him as the rock upon which the church would be built. This almost didn't happen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Peter denied even knowing him. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. It says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him, and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. What makes matters worse is that Jesus had prophesied that this would happen. Jesus told him that before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter felt horrible. He heard the rooster crow. He remembered Jesus' words to him. He was cut to the heart. He was gutted. And the scripture says he went out and wept bitterly. Have you ever messed up badly? So badly that you would give anything to reverse it? And you knew there was nothing, absolutely nothing you could do about it? Well, this is how Peter felt. Once milk has been spilt, it can't be unspilt. He loved Jesus. He gave up everything to follow Him. And for three years, He was part of the ministry of Christ. But when the going got tough... When Jesus needed him, Peter gave in to fear and he deserted his Lord. And it wasn't just once, it was three times. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt? After the first time that he did that, he must have felt bad. Realizing what he had done, realizing that he, was, he had just denied this person 
who you were so dedicated to and who loved Him so much. And then, it happened a second time. After the second time, He must have felt worse. And then, unbelievably, it happened a third time. After the third time, He was devastated. This was the moment when everything was going south and it looked like Peter would play no further part in the advancement of the kingdom of God. But Jesus had other plans. He rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and all kinds of evil, including denial, betrayal, and desertion. He told the woman who were the first witnesses of the resurrection to go tell the disciples and Peter. And then he did this. Let us read this passage from John chapter 21, verse 9 to 19. I'm reading from the uh, New Living Translation. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let them know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, as we think back to this incident that happened 2,000 years ago, we are amazed at the grace displayed towards Peter. And it is my prayer, Lord, and it is my desire that that grace be part of our own experience. That what we saw, what happened in the life of Peter, would happen in our lives too. I pray that you would be with us this morning as we look at this passage and think about your grace to Peter. I pray that this would speak to us loudly and clearly, and that we would experience your grace even today even in this place, and even during this coronavirus pandemic. May you bless us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage, we see Jesus extending wonderful grace to Peter. He did not reject him. He did not berate him. He restored him. After his resurrection, 
Jesus told the disciples to go to Galilee. And he said, there you will see me. They had to go there and wait for Jesus. So they were obedient. They went to Galilee. And as they waited, they did some fishing. It wasn't all very successful as this specific night in question it became clear that they worked all night and they caught no fish. But then in the morning, at daybreak, there was Jesus on the shore, appearing to them for the third time since his resurrection, meeting them in Galilee as he had promised. But what we want to focus on this morning is the interaction between Jesus and Peter. As I said, this sermon is about Peter. It is not about the miraculous catch of fish. It is not about the other disciples. It is not about anything else but just the interaction between Jesus and Peter. That personal, intimate interaction that took place that changed Peter's life and his legacy. Jesus talks to Peter and he says, Do you love me more than than these. You see, Peter boasted that he would not desert Jesus even if all the other disciples did. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, as they went out after the Last Supper, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 26, verse 27. It says, uh, it talks about uh, the Last Supper. It says, and Jesus took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. You see, this is why some people just love Peter. Because he wears his heart on his sleeve. He speaks it out as it comes into his mind. But also, we see Peter being impetuous. We see Peter making promises he can't keep. We see Peter speaking out the intentions of his heart, but his actions don't seem to follow. But this is the claim that he makes. Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. There's a subtext there. I love you more than these. Even if they all desert you, I won't desert you. I am more loyal to you. I love you more. I have a deeper commitment to you than the other disciples. That's the subtext of what he's saying. So Jesus then asks him this question, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know I love you. See what is, what is different from his response. Jesus says, do you love me more than these? And he comes back and says, Lord, you know I love you. He doesn't say, I love you more than these. He says, Lord, you know that I love you. This is a humble Peter. It's not the same cocky Peter who earlier that night said, or not that night, but the night that Jesus was betrayed, not that Peter that said, if everyone deserts you, I won't desert you. This was a humble Peter that said, Lord, I love you and you know that I love you. But he's not comparing his love for God or for Christ to that of the other disciples. 
Jesus is asking him three times. The three questions that Jesus asked, the three times he's asking Peter to confirm his love for him, balances out the three denials of Christ. The three times that Peter said, I don't know the man. Jesus is presenting him with this opportunity of restoration, of making right what he did wrong. Each time when Peter answers and says, yes, you know I love you, I do, Jesus then affirmed, uh, affirms him and gives him a command. He says, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Yes, I am restoring you. Yes, I'm giving you a chance to redeem yourself. Yes, we are canceling out those three denials. But once we've done that, we're bringing it back to this command that I have for you, this vocation that I have for you, this calling that I have upon your life. Peter, this is not about therapy. This is not about having, wanting you to feel better about yourself. I know that you were beating yourself up because of what you did. I know how bitterly disappointed you were in yourself, but this is not about that. This is about something much bigger than that. This is about the kingdom of God, and I have a role for you to play. Peter, I am reinstating you. This is the coach saying, you're still on the team after you've messed up. I still want you. The coach letting it be known to the other players that you are still part of the team. You are being reinstated, restored as a leader on this team. What's interesting is that Jesus, when He affirms him, when He gives him that command, He says, he says can you take care of my feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. Jesus is entrusting His most precious lambs to Peter, the one who did not stand with Him, but the one who denied Him three times, the one who left Him in the lurch. To Him, He is entrusting His precious lambs and His sheep. Peter finds that the one person he disappointed is precisely the one that is restoring him. How beautiful is that? Tom Wright, one of the theologians in, um, in England, writes this uh, personal encounter that he had, uh, which really speaks to this specific situation. He tells a story. He says, He had offered to help clear up after the dinner party. Indeed, he was eager to do so. We gave him a towel and he worked away with us, wiping pans and jugs. But he was still excited after the events of the day and his mind wasn't really on the job. Once or twice we suggested he might like to sit down to read or relax, but he wanted to go on. Then, it happened. He picked up the new crystal water jug that we'd been given a few weeks before. He began to wipe it, but as he did so, he turned around to say something to the others. He didn't notice one of them turning towards him at the same moment until it was too late. He was crestfallen. We were devastated, but tried not to show it. He swept up the broken glass off the floor. He promised to buy us another jug. He left a little later in a flood of apologies. We struggled to think through what forgiveness would mean in a case like that. We were angry, of course, but we knew it had happened because he was just too eager for his own good. We thought about it a lot. Then, a couple of weeks later, we invited him to a meal again. And this time, after the meal, we invited him to
to help us clear up. Again, we gave him a towel. He looked at us with a stare of disbelief. We smiled. He helped. It was fine. Restoration from the very people that were harmed in the first place. It is the most beautiful gift to give another human being. And Jesus does this for Peter. By His grace, He restores Peter and reappoints him as an, an apostle in front of the others. But in case you're not convinced, I found something really cool. I felt like a detective gathering information from different passages, piecing this all together for the sermon. We see that in His grace, Jesus set this whole encounter up around a charcoal fire. Guess what? There is a specific Greek word for a charcoal fire. We have anglicized that and we use it anthracite for charcoal. That word, that Greek word occurs only twice in the whole New Testament. The first time is in Matthew 18, where Peter denies knowing Christ. It says, because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. That was when the denial took place. Around that charcoal fire. And then, when the grace of Jesus, when He comes to reinstate Peter and to restore him, we see in John 21.9, He says, when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. The same Greek word used in both instances, the only two instances in the whole New Testament. You see the connection. It's beautiful. It's restorative. It is life-giving. It is the grace of God flowing through Jesus Christ. Can you see how gracious Jesus is? And how did Peter respond? How did he respond to this grace of God that restored him? Well, he came back stronger than ever. Fifty days after the resurrection, he preached in Jerusalem. He faced some of the very people he was afraid of. And he declared his loyalty to Christ openly. And he later faced death for Christ's sake, crucified under Emperor Nero at Rome in the early 60s. This also was prophesied by Jesus. We saw that in verse 18 of our passage. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. That was the sign for the cross. And others will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. And then verse 19 was said, Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Tradition has it that Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. He did not think that he was worthy to be crucified in the same way as his Lord. Jesus told Peter, after the restoration, follow me. And he did follow Jesus, even to the cross. Let's bring it home. Where are you at in your Christian walk? Do you need restoration? Are you following Jesus like you want to? Or do you need to be restored? Have you denied your Savior? Have you given in 
to pressure from friends or family or co-workers and abandoned your Lord? Do you feel disappointed with yourself and what you have done? This morning, do you need to hear Jesus say, yes, you messed up. But my grace is sufficient for you. You are still on the team. If that is you, then there is one question for you this morning. Do you love Jesus? Can you say, yes, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you? If that is you, I would like to pray for you this morning. Let us bow our heads. Lord Jesus, I think back to that time when you restored Peter. After everything that he had done, denying you three times, calling down curses upon himself, saying, I don't know the man. I'm so impressed, I'm so taken aback by the way, Lord, that you interacted with him. Not scolding him or berating him or using it as a teaching moment to let him know where he went wrong and what he should have done. But just coming to him in grace, lovingly restoring him, and then sending him out to be your ambassador, to speak for you, to bring reconciliation between you and the people around him. Lord, I pray for us. I pray for anyone today who prays with me this prayer, Lord, who says, yes, I need to be restored. I have messed up. I have done things which I am ashamed of. I have done things which I can never take back. But I so wish I could. And I want to hear my Lord and my Savior speak to me these wonderful words. Saying, you are still on the team. My grace is sufficient for you. Go and feed my lambs. Go and take care of my sheep. I have not thrown you away, but I have embraced you. You are mine. I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for you. And I will change your life to become more and more like mine. And I pray, Lord, that this will be true for each and every one of us. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen.